Welcome to Hope is Here. My name is Greg Horn and I want to talk to you today and tomorrow about being called to be loved. I think that's one of the things that I found is the most difficult for people to just realize is that God loves them. And we're going to be talking about that here more in just a couple of minutes, but I just uh by the time you hear this, this program will be it'll be about a week out, recording uh, a week out. But the revival at Asbury has been going on, and um, over five days, almost six days now, actually. And I don't know if it'll still be going on by the time you hear this, but it just stirs my heart because I don't know if you remember ago, but two weeks from this, uh, I guess three weeks actually, by the time you're hearing this, that we I'd shared a story by Professor. Uh, Edwin Orr of Wheaton University, who in the 1940 had taken a group of students from Wheaton University to England to visit sites of the great revivals. And one of their steps was the Epworth Rectory, and uh, it now serves as a museum, but it was formerly the home of John Wesley, the famous reformer who led a wave of spiritual renewal in the 1700s and actually was the founder of the Methodist Church, but he was a great man of prayer. And he had interceded for revival to sweep through England and to spread to America. And Dr. Orr pointed out to two warm places on the carpet next to John Wesley's bed where the man knelt for hours in prayer each day crying out for revival in England and and go to America. And as history tells us, that's exactly what happened. Heaven broke in and revival broke out. And then as they had finished up the tour of that home and they got uh, of John Wesley's home, they got back on the bus. The professor, like any good leader, counted to make sure he had everybody and he was missing one of his students. So he went back into John Wesley's house and was looking and heard somebody talking upstairs. And he went up and there was somebody kneeling on their, in front of John Wesley's bed and those in front of his bed, in front of those two spots that were worn out in the carpet where John Wesley had fervently prayed for revival to start there in England and into the United States. And it was one of his students, and he heard him praying, just pleading, do it again, Lord, do it again. Send revival, and would you do it again with me? Placed his hand on the young man's shoulder. He said, son, it's time to go. Uh, We need to leave. Everybody else is on the bus. And the young man said, I'm ready to go. And, uh, that student was Billy Graham. And so that we have done that three weeks. Uh, it was actually about a week and a half after we had done that program, Do It Again, Lord, which was based on that story about the revival starting in England and trying to come to the United States. And then Billy Graham, of course, his life and the revivals that he held all over the world. And that God here in central Kentucky has done that it just brought tears to my eyes when that broke out recently. And like I said, I don't know, it may still be going on by the time you hear this, but even if not, it was over a hundred hours as I record this and just God is doing it again. He is showing that he loves us. He wants to speak to his kids, but more important, I think he's saying to us, would you surrender your lives? Would you rededicate your lives and put me as your first love? And not second, third, fourth, fifth on the things that you love, but putting me first. I mean, you know, friends, it's sad. Uh, the Super Bowl, you know, was just recently played a week ago, and uh, I heard a story leading up to it. Tim Tebow, it's been, I believe, 15 years ago, but, you know, a lot of times football players will paint the black stuff underneath their eyes because it helps when they look up into the lights, the reflection. And he put the Bible verse, John three sixteen under his eyes before it national championship game that he played in and like I said it's around 15 years ago give or take a little bit and it winds up that uh, somebody told him a week later that 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 day in that 24-hour period that over 10 million people looked up John 316 it was googled it looked up online now friends most of you that list this program are followers of Jesus and you're like wow I thought everybody knew John 316 or at least the majority of people that we know, and yet over 10 million that day Googled John 3.16. They didn't know it, that for God so loved 
the world that he gave his one only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And maybe if you're listening today and you don't know John 3.16, man, I am so glad you're listening. Whether you're listening live on the radio or you're listening to our YouTube channel, watching on our YouTube channel, Hope is Here. Uh, or if a podcast, uh, somebody shared it with you or you're just scrolling looking for something with hope and you found this or you saw it posted on social media, I'm so glad that you're listening today. And I want you to know that God loves you. He loves you. And I love John 3.17. We, you know, a lot of people know 3.16. Not everybody, obviously, but, but you know, we kind of just stop at John 3.16, which is powerful. But, you know, the next verse, Jesus said that he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And he did that by laying down his life, the ultimate act of love. And, you know, the fact of the matter is the Bible tells us that God is love. That God does, doesn't have love. God doesn't just show love. God is love. Love is the nature, the character, the essence of God. There would be no love in the universe if it weren't for the fact that God is love. And, you know, in Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about long before he made the world, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Well, just go back to the beginning of that verse says, God loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. You know, so many of you think God just sees your faults. Friends, it's not true. God sees so many wonderful things about you. The Bible tells us that we're created in his image. It goes on to say in verse 5 in Ephesians that God's unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave God great pleasure. You know, maybe you're listening like, you know, I don't really have any family left or where it's because you're single, divorced, widowed. Uh, I mean, 46% of our population here in the United States is that. And I want you to know, friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in God's family, okay? You are in God's family. And one of the things I think sometimes that we forget is that, um, you know, our, our first purpose of my life is to be loved by God. Uh, we started doing this 40-day devotional book at the church where I'm pastor, Gardenside Christian Church here in Lexington. And uh, this powerful 40-day devotional, What on Earth Am I Here For? by Rick Warren. And, you know, he tells us the first purpose of our life is to be loved by God. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, we think that, well, uh, we we got to serve God. Uh, we've got to, you know, got to work, obey God. Um, you know, we've got to love God. No, the first purpose of our life is to let God love you. And that's hard for type A personalities like me. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking I've got to do stuff for God, for him to love me. And, you know, friends, God didn't create us in the first place, just to do something. He created us in the first place to receive something. And I know a lot of you, uh, you're like me, you struggle to receive. You're fine with giving. You love to give. And yet, you struggle to receive. And so for some of you listening today, uh, just like it was for me when I read this in the 40-day devotional book recently, What on Earth Am I Here For? Uh, It was a revolutionary truth to me. And... Uh, but man, when, when we get that perspective right, that God wants to love us, we are loved by God. It's not about us doing things for him. And it, it, I mean, yes, because we love him, we like to do things with anybody in a relationship that we love, whether it's a significant other or a family member, a coworker, a neighbor. I mean, yeah, we love people. We want to do things f- for them because it's an act of love. But Our number one purpose in life is not to do something for God. It's to receive something from God. It's to receive his love. And we were made to be a receptible, a receiver, a benefactor of God's love. I'll say that one more time. We were made to be a receptible, a receiver, a benefactor of God's love. You know, our first duty in life is not to do something. It's not to learn. It's not to listen. It's not to pray. It's not to give. It's not to sacrifice. It's not even to serve. Those are all good things. 
but they're not the first thing that God created you to do. He created you to accept and to receive his love, to just let God love you. That's your first person, first purpose of life. That is your first purpose, is just to be loved by God. And somebody listen today, you just need to know that. If you grew up in church, uh, you remember a song we used to sing as kids, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Friends, you know, I'm here to tell you over 40 years later since I've sang that song, um, getting closer to 50, <laughs> ouch, <laughs> that God truly does love me. He loves you. He loves you. And it's so important for you to know today and be reminded of that, that God wants to love you and that he cares about you. Jude chapter 1, verse 1. I mean, a lot of people would honestly say, Jude, where is that in the Bible? And it's only one chapter. So if you want to be able to say, hey, I read a whole chapter in the Bible, uh, Jude, read the book of Jude, 25 verses. It's the next to last book in the Bible, right in front of Revelation. So be kind of nice to maybe just say, you know what, I'm going to read that today after being reminded of it here today on Hope is Here. But Jude chapter 1, verse 1 says, This letter is from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I am writing to all who are called to live in the love of God, the Father, and in the care of Jesus Christ. You know, something really amazing about that. Jude was the half-brother of Jesus. Obviously, uh, we as followers of Jesus believe that Jesus, Mary was a virgin, you know. So they weren't his full brothers, but they were half-brothers. Since, And can you imagine having Jesus your brother? And, uh, you know, you guys get into it and you go to your mom and go to Mary, if you're Jude, and say, Jesus did this, you know, that's wrong, blah, blah, blah. And you know Mary's response is going to be like, come on, Jude, we know that Jesus... He doesn't do anything wrong. <laughs> Maybe you grew up with a brother or sister like that. Seemed like they never did anything wrong. But Jude, I love his heart, though, because, I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of us can be name droppers. I've been guilty of being time at times like that. Like, oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. And yet Jude doesn't say that. He describes himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Doesn't say, hey, also, I'm, I'm related to Jesus. Yeah, I'm his half-brother. I love the humility there in Jude, showing that he just wants to be called in verse 1 of Jude, chapter 1, the only chapter, I'm being called to live in the love of God, the Father, and in the care of Jesus Christ. For somebody today, maybe you just want to write that verse down, Jude chapter 1, verse 1, to say, you know what? I'm called to live in the love of God, the Father, and in the care of Jesus Christ. Know today, friends, that your heavenly Father, God, and Jesus, they love you and they care about you and they hurt when you hurt. So know and stand on that promise today. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I hope you'll tune in again tomorrow. Or we're going to continue talking about being called to love. We're going to look at how long, how wide, and how deep is God's love for us. My name's Greg Horn, and this is Hope is Here.